And by the way, it's not up to somebody else to honor your boundaries. And that's a mistake that people often make. Oh, you violated my boundary. Well, of course, it's not their boundary. If I set a boundary, it's up to me to enforce it, not you. It's up to me to enforce it. All right, Dr. Heath, thank you so much for joining me today. Glad to be here. I have my uh, Kahlua latte ready to go. <laughs> awesome. I've just been enjoying this during a lovely conversation with you, my friend, and I appreciate interacting on the X platform, and we have some interesting conversations, and I just love exploring ideas and uh, learning about other people's mindset and thoughts and how they arrived at them. So I'm looking forward to a, a peppy, spicy conversation. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Uh, you mentioned X, like that's where we met and uh, we've engaged on some spaces there. You host a lot of spaces. For anyone that's not on X and not familiar with you, can you give a little background to who you are? Um, I, I got into uh, psychology back in the early 80s. I was a psych tech on a uh, SMI unit, which is severely mentally ill unit. Uh, so lots of folks with uh, schizophrenia, schizophrenia form disorder, schizoaffective disorder, you know, mania, you know, you name it. And, uh, you know, we kind of kind of threw everybody into one mix back then and didn't really differentiate it, which we probably should have. But uh, then I went to undergrad school. Uh, I uh, got degrees in um, different areas of psychology. Um, and other things. I was a quadruple major in undergrad, so I got a degree in uh, psychology, but also social work, which is kind of a, a lateral field to psychology, as well as speech and the psychology of speech, but also uh, uh, theology. So I found that theology fits pretty well with uh, psychology. And then I went to grad school. I got a double master's. I got a master's in psychology and social work. And then I went uh, from a PhD and got a dual PhD in neuropsychology and uh, forensic psychology. So that's my background. And I have a, a private clinic. I've started, you know, I don't know, a, a bunch of uh, psychiatric units and, you know, develop policies for those, staff those, train those, uh, mainly gero, uh, you know, geriatric psych units, you know, for the elderly. And I've started many, many private practice clinics, you know, ran, operated, sold those to other people. And now I'm a solo practitioner, uh, just of my own clinic in my backyard. So I have a close, a really close walk to work. It is my own little poolside clinic that I see, I don't know, I probably do 30 six to 45 hours of mm -hmm. clinical work a week. And then I try to fit all this stuff in to, yeah. you know, keep my skills sharp, share out information in kind of different ways, correct some myths in the fields of uh, psychology, which on social media, it is full of myths on psychology and uh, people often get it wrong. Uh, so, uh, I just kind of like having conversations and seeing why people think what they think and where they get that from and kind of bouncing ideas off of each other. Awesome. First of all, spaces, how cool of a, a concept is that? I mean, I, I can't think of anywhere else on social media and the large platforms that you have that kind of, I consider it a town hall like atmosphere. I can't see anywhere else like that. Oh, really? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, the, the closest would be podcasting where there's a call in feature and few people have that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what made Dr. Uh, Laura so famous and um, Dr. Ruth, you know, the sex therapist, Dr. Ruth, uh, is it the audience interaction. And, and yeah. we talked on a space before this that, you know, I think little known to many people with X's intent to be the everything platform is they see the power of podcasting and you will yeah. see the fields of podcasting and spaces merge and become one. Yeah, I, I definitely see him going in that direction. One of the, you, you held a, a space on audio today for spaces and I, I was in for a bit of it and 
I don't know if anyone brought this up, but so like the recording software we're using right now, it's Riverside and you're recording, it's uploading on your, uh, your device. So even if we have a little glitchiness in our conversation live, the recording should be pure and it should be seamless. Like it'll be a clean recording, even if there's some audio dropouts live. Do you know if X is doing that or if they plan to? <laughs> uh, I would almost promise you that they are. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I, I would. And, and I think probably behind the scenes, Riverside, uh, StreamYard. Uh, gosh, what's the other one? Um, Squadcast. Well, well, it, it, it's it's third party software that yeah. helps podcasters like yourself and me. For instance, I use uh, Ecamm. And so there's a kind of, um, uh, what would you call it? There's a kind of a, a, a workaround for doing what you and I are doing, where it's, it's simulcast to, I simulcast to LinkedIn. Uh, you can simulcast to Instagram if they give you permission, but that's kind of a high hurdle. And mm. I don't really understand all of that. Um uh, let's see, link, uh, Facebook, YouTube, so, and, and, and X. So I simulcast to four different social media platforms. And okay. so, um, uh, the, the software to do that is, is pretty, uh, pretty high programmed, uh, 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 can be a bit expensive to, to rent, to have a subscription to, which I have a subscription, uh, to, uh, Ecamm. But uh, my point is, I think that in being the everything app, you're going to see all the functionality that you have on Riverside and StreamYard and Ecamm uh, coming to X. Uh, and we talked about the reason for that, you know, and the reason for that is, and this is just my hypothesis, is not because Elon Musk sees a lot of profit in podcasting, and I think there is. But there's definitely a lot of profit going to be gained from AI. Yeah. And so in in making yourself, making your platform uh, podcast live stream friendly, everything that we're saying is being fed into the big machine he calls Grok, the AI yeah. machine Grok. And that's what uh, AI is all about is it is a information hog, and he wants to beat all other AI systems, and he's very well positioned to do that with X because it's one of the largest databases on earth. And literally, <laughs> this will scare some people, uh, literally everything you type, whether it's in a post, a reply, or a direct message. Some people don't understand. Some people think that direct messages are private, and they're not. No. Um, they're private from others on the platform, but they're by no means private from X engineers or Grok who is scanning everything. So everything that you say in a space will be cataloged and will be used by AI as part of their database. You know, uh, AI is about like uh, <laughs> about like the Borg from Star Trek. You know, resistance is futile. You will be assimilated. <laughs> yeah, and that might freak <laughs> some people out, but honestly, there's so much data being recorded of everyone all of the time anyway. Like if you have Google Maps open up, it's probably recording your audio and feeding it back somewhere. It's always well, happening. Well, I actually had an engineer tell me because I said something like that. I said, you know, you have to, you know, you have to say the name of this device that's over there that, you know, it's the name that should not be spoken because it'll wake it up. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I won't, it'll start talking back to me. But see, that's the myth. The myth is that it only wakes up when you call its name. But the engineer called my attention to, then how do it, how, if it's not always awake, how's it going to know you're calling its name? Yeah. It has to always be awake to be aware when you're calling its name. Therefore, that device is always listening. You just yeah. don't know it. Yeah. Which yeah. really kind of feeds into what we're talking about. Because humans are humans. Have, you, you've had an AI ever since you were born. Ever since you were born, you had an AI. You just carried it around in your head, and you didn't know it. 
but it is always on. It is always listening, and it is called your subconscious. Hmm. And you don't have to call its name to wake it up. It's always awake. It's always listening. And so you will say things, and this gets into the conversation that you and I had. Uh, you will say, well, let me back up. Every experience doesn't become a memory. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I may not remember that the spoon in my coffee cup is pointed uh, northwest, but it is. That's northwest. There's no reason for me to remember that. Um, so that may not be that may not be graduated to the level of my hippocampus, which is uh, a double seahorse looking structure that transmits, writes, encodes information into the neocortex, uh, but it can. So things can be experienced and not become a memory. But also, and this, this is true for the bulk of information, is that information can be encoded and we don't know the source of the information. Uh, for instance, you may not know, you know, where you heard that the capital, well, where did you learn that the capital of Utah was Salt Lake City? Who first told you that? No idea. So that's called source amnesia. Yeah. Now, you know the capital is Salt, it's Salt Lake City, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, so I'm not from Utah, but, uh, but uh, uh, it is. But you don't know that. So that's called source amnesia. So other pieces of information, we store it but we disconnect the source of the information. So that gets us into, you know, we were talking about manipulation. So you might say that the source of information for Salt Lake City being the capital of Utah was Heath that we met when you were, you know, in first grade or something. And I told you this, but you didn't connect that information to me. And so you forgot that I was the one that told you. And then I moved to Nashville, Tennessee, and then Arkansas. Um, however, the rub is that just because I told you that Salt Lake City was the capital of Utah doesn't mean you were forced to store that information. At the intersection of my words and your categorizing of my words, you could have decided that was false. You could have decided that was useless. You could have decided it was not pay worth paying attention to, so you ignored it. You could have decided many things. So it's at the, the nexus of that decision-making process where we store information, and then often, actually more often than we would think, most things you know, you have no idea at what point you decided, and you must decide. Yeah. Uh, you must decide to store information uh, subconsciously, consciously, some way. And then uh, there's other bits of information which we have decided to store it, but we don't know how we decided to store it. We don't know why we decided to store it. And we don't even know that we stored it to begin with. Why? Well, for this very reason. Uh, in the brain, none of that stuff was important uh, for that information to make a difference, just like this spoon being pulled in Northwest, there's no reason to know that. So most information you know, there's really no reason to know all those things I just mentioned. And as a matter of fact, if your brain was wired up, so you had your your uh, had you know you're an autistic savant or something like that, like Kim Peek Rain Man, then you would be a professional patient. You would not be able to function. Because yeah. your brain has limited storage capacity like any memory device. And so you could cough that stuff up like Kim Peek could. But then again, you would need care in other areas of your life because the room that that information took up would also eliminate your ability to store information on social interaction, social appropriateness, how to brush your teeth, how to bathe and toilet yourself, how yeah. to do your bills. And so storage. Uh, information storage in the brain is very costly. And so your brain is very careful, usually, how you store it. And it's storing it based on what you, you know, what you've accrued up to this point. So you're really deciding uh, the value of storing information now. That doesn't get decided now. How you store information now, you've already decided that weeks, months, or even years ago. And what you're most likely to store 
uh, is information that you deem is less of a threat to you. So if I say something to you like, you cannot be manipulated because you have free will, free agency, already the AI in your brain is choosing not to believe that because of something you decided years ago. Hmm. Yeah, uh, so let's talk about this some more because I think it's interesting. <laughs> I feel like there's... Uh, oh, and different... by the way, I had to point out. Yeah. So in, your, in our conversation on X, you use yeah. the F word a lot. Well, <laughs> what F word? Because I know I didn't swear. <laughs> it's a four-letter word. It starts with F. You just said it. You see how, how the brain stores information? Yeah. You use it so much you're not aware that you felt So you categorize what you're about to say as a feeling. But I'm going to guess it's, you're not going to share a feeling with me at all. You're going to share a cognition. Yeah. You're going to share a thought process, feelings, sad, mad, glad, disgusted, shame, stress, press, anxious, anger, fear. Those are feelings. You're probably not about to share one of those. You're going to share a cognition, which I'll say this one more thing. By the way, that's such a cute puppy dog back there. What's the puppy dog's <laughs> name? Uh, little Charlie. Charlie oh, and how old is Charlie? Uh, he's about 10. Oh, wow. Yeah. What a cute little fella there. Yeah. You have another one? Yeah, Zoe right here. She's uh, I can't she's see one. Zoe. Uh, she's your microphone's in the way of Zoe. Yeah, yeah. she probably blends in with the couch a little bit too. <laughs> Zoe the chameleon puppy. Yeah, she blends in with the couch. So the, the thing about feelings is people, people will do that. They, they will store cognitions. They will label them as a feeling. And since feelings can never be wrong, you can never be mistaken about a feeling. You yeah. will never say, you'll never hear somebody say, well, I thought I was sad, but I was so wrong. I was really filled with joy. I thought I was filled with joy, but it really wasn't. It was really terror, my mistake. So the brain already encodes that feelings can never, ever be wrong. You can't get them wrong. Yeah. Therefore, when you attach a feeling to what is essentially a cognition, you've told your brain the cognition must be accurate because I feel something which that's just terrible storage technique because cognitions can be an error. But if you label them as a feeling, you're telling your brain automatically uh, that it is correct just because you have a feeling. And yeah. there is no feeling that equals correctness of a cognition. So <laughs> when I'm using the word feel in that context, I'm not really talking about a feeling. I'm expressing an idea and I'm using the word feel because it's less aggressive than true. saying it's true, That's what right? you think. Consciously, I know what you're doing. Unconsciously, your brain sees it differently and you don't even know it. Interesting. I think so. Because, I mean, for me, uh, what I wrote would probably take me about five minutes to just write it, but I spent about an hour sitting there thinking about it before I, you yeah. know, just formulating it and rereading what you wrote and rethinking and going back and forth with myself. Cause I like to be accurate. I like to mm -hmm. make sure that I'm not saying something that I, I'm going to find out is not true even in my own mind, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to, why don't you just lay out your uh, general position on it because it was masculinity, toxicity, gaslighting, and control. Is it? Um, it was uh, uh, manipulating, gaslighting, controlling, and toxicity. Yeah, those those four. Those four. I I, I view those as four low hanging fruit. <laughs> That's that that people really gobble up on yeah. social media. And they gobble them up because uh, deep in their psyches, they they have engineered their brains to believe they're safer, believing that an effect is externalized. Uh, if I can say this wasn't because I made too quick of a decision. 
this wasn't because I could have done otherwise. This wasn't because I was ignoring important aspects of the situation. This was because someone controlled me or manipulated me or gaslit me or was toxic to me. And if I can say that, then that really aids the fight or flight response because all I got to do is get away. Yeah. And that seems safer. The problem is, it's kind of like saying, I'm having so many problems in Nashville. If I can just leave Nashville, my life will be wonderful. Not realizing Nashville was never really the problem. uh, And you'll take all those problems with you. And all the patterns that got you in the relationship you're in. And again, I'm not arguing uh, whether someone's behavior is proper. You know, Uh, what I'm arguing is, I think, something far greater. And that is uh, we always have ultimate uh, free will and that agency is inviolate. It, it Uh It is just always the case. And I have some examples and, and I use extreme examples to make the point. There's all kinds of problems, um, you know, from cognitive science, from uh, forensic psychology, from uh, theology. If we say that free will can be violated and that agency can be suspended. And uh, those are some pretty high hurdles to overcome. You know, so as a cognitive scientist, if somebody says, I can manipulate people, I would say, well, then do it on me. Go. One, two, three, go. Manipulate me into doing something. Against my free will, uh, you you can penetrate the vault of my skull. You can fiddle-faddle with my neurons and make me, you know, I don't know, strip on camera or something. I'd pay somebody good money if they could do that. You know, everybody with telekinesis in the room raised my right hand. No. (laughs) Oh, that's my left hand. You got it wrong. (laughs) So I think I I agree with you in that I think uh, toxicity, gaslighting, manipulation, those words are overused, definitely. I think people use those as ways to explain something externally that might have more internal explanation than they want to let let up on, you know? But I also think they're true things too. They're things that can exist. And one of the examples that I gave to you, so my position is I don't think uh, manipulation requires taking away someone's free will. It's they're still actively engaging with the process. So somebody who is manipulated in the case of an actual m- manipulation, which we can cover. Well, but, 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 but let's take it a bite at a time. Yeah. Which is why I call my account therapy bites, you know, bite at a time. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, so uh, it, it's, if you're, by the way, those listeners, if, if you're going to have a debate with somebody, um, it, it's really essential to define terms. Otherwise, you very well could be thinking about two different things. So we're talking about manipulation. And so I, I would have to understand what you mean by manipulation if you're, if you're not removing my free will. Yeah. So uh, I explained when we we're in a little bit of our back and forth because you define manipulation as having to be manipulating a thing, right? Um, for me... Well, now, the reason I say thing is because... Um, You're thinking of manual manipulation. It, it is, well, not necessarily. Uh, um, I mean, I, yeah, but but if, if you have... If the, 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 the thing that... <laughs> the, the thing that differentiates uh, humans from... Uh, say AI, which is big in the news, is free will. You know, mm-hmm. uh, so uh, free will kind of mucks everything up. You know, and if if I have free will, then there are certain rights that I have. And at the point that AI develops free will, I think we'll see the argument. You know, like we saw in the great movie, one of my favorites, uh, I Robot. 
you know, does Sonny have certain rights as a robot that can make his own mind up about stuff? So at the point where I can make my own mind up about stuff, how is my making up my own mind about stuff eliminated when you're trying to get me to do something? And if you can get me to do something, then that means I have no free will, which then philosophically means that I become an object if I have no free will. So when I think which of AI is an object. Yeah. So when I think of manipulation, and I kind of said this in one of my responses to you, is I think of it as a distortion or change of the incoming data. So I feel like that's where the manipulation happens. It's not so much that somebody can make you do something. It's that they change the input of data that you're using to make your decision. So they influence the decision in a negative way. Well, I think you just took a leap there. You're, you're, you, you jump from they are deciding what Lego pieces of information to provide yeah. And and it's a big leap from that because I would agree with you. Uh let's take a car salesman. You mentioned a car salesman. Yeah. I could wash the vehicle. I could roll the odometer back. I could polish the tires, you know. I, I could do all kinds of things. So those are the pieces of data that I will put on the table. That is the menu of data I will put on the table for you. But at that point, um, how does that prevent me from slowing down, uh, realizing that you're a car salesman, that your motivation is probably selling me a car, uh, that maybe you have higher value on selling a car than presenting me with accurate data, which is going to kind of heighten my radar for looking around at things. And so I might want to take it for a test drive. I might want to see the car facts. I might want to look under the hood. You know, I might want to vet what you're saying. So my my question is, or, or my point is, it's a huge leap to saying you're deciding what data to, to, to share with me, but then I lack the ability to weigh each piece of data and to, to accept some and disregard others. And at the point where I began, I began to accept some and disregard others, that is the absence of manipulation. Okay. I, I get what you're saying. And I'm, I'm making, what I'm arguing is that there is, manipulation doesn't require any, any, restriction of free will like okay. I, so the example i used uh is in my last response to you was the reichstag fire um uh, can you say that again the reichstag fire um i don't remember the things i don't that, I, did i read that i don't remember reading that the reichstag i don't you hadn't replied yet so you oh, might yeah yeah, yeah. Fill, fill so, me in what that is okay so the reichstag fire was in uh, Germany before Hitler completely took over control, right? Okay. And there was a fire and it was most likely caused by one of the Nazis. But what they did, what Hitler did is he blamed it on the communists to further gain control of the government in Germany. So I would look at that as a manipulation. I would say anyone could have looked at it and tried to be more objective and discern the truth. And this is true of most political situations. There's deception and stuff like that. But nonetheless, people acted and made decisions based on flawed data. Sure, they could have made the right decision. They could have been more discerning. But in the end, what, what actually took place there? So what would that be called? I, I would say that they made a decision, and I would say just because I agreed to accept your presentation doesn't mean you, you manipulated me because of why I made the decision to accept your version of the events. I, I was in a space with Honey Badger the other night about China. Uh, I was in China uh, for a couple of weeks, a couple of decades ago. We were on a 
well, I'll just say we were over there to uh, to hike through the mountains. Yeah. And and what I discovered was the grand difference in the people in China and the people in the United States is they tend to be very compliant. It is their culture to be very compliant. Yeah. And and they're some of the nicest people on the planet. Uh, when I was hiking through the mountains, they they didn't know me from Adam, but they would invite me into their homes and feed me their food. And these are people that didn't have much food. Uh, I was in one village and they brought a, a, a steaming plate of food. Uh, and the whole plate was really meant to be shared amongst a whole village. But they offered me the whole plate of food. So they're very hospitable people. So their culture is to be compliant. Let me say that a different way. They place a high value on compliance with group norms and culture yeah. above and beyond what is good or healthy for them as individuals. However, they could decide. They could decide in a situation that there's more value in being an individual than, you know, being in this in this group of compliance. So at the point of decision, that is the antithesis of being manipulated. Hitler decided what to present. People decided whether to accept that or not. And back then in Germany, yes, it was a culture of people that were very, the, the culture was to be compliant to you know, the Nazi doctrine. But we have to look at, can, you know, things that confound that and things that confound that w would be the resistance. So another thing you have to explain with manipulation is if it is so reliable, why is it actually not that reliable? If it is so effectual, why doesn't it affect everybody? Why was there a Schindler who a famous movie was made about? Yeah. Why was there a uh, Eli Wiesel? Why was there a Victor Frankel? Why are all these outliers seemingly immune like myself? You know, I challenge it. Again, any discussion I have with people that believe in manipulation, I say, go for it. I'm going to sit here and you can, you know, I tell people, you know, kind of tongue in cheek, you know, squeeze your sphincter muscles together really, really hard and see if you can make me do anything. And yeah. I'll tell you if you get it right. I've never had one person ever able to do that, and let, and, 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 but they will, they will say that manipulation is possible. Uh, I had a wonderful letter after our discussion, by the way, an email, and I got permission to share this, and I'll try to put it up. And, and, and the person said, who's a very dear person, by the way, they said, uh, to your comment about why are you immune, it would be very helpful to the rest of us if you would break that down. And, and if you can give an example of where maybe you weren't immune to manipulation and then you became immune to manipulation, I, I think it was a great question. Now, I've been thinking about that all day, and I don't think I have a good answer for that because... I, I look back and I think maybe the best example I have is when I was very, very young, um, I, uh, and I was told I was the problem. And I think you, maybe you brought this up with children or maybe someone else brought this up. Uh, one of our friends, Golden, was in the conversation too. She's, a, she's a, a wonderful friend. But when I was very, very young and I was told I was the problem, I, I really zeroed in on that information and came to believe that I was the problem. I was too loud, uh, and I really wasn't a loud kid, or I was the one making people angry. So all I had to do was take responsibility for making you angry. Yeah. But I guess the difference came to be when, as, as terminal connections began to be made in my brain, and I started paying attention, I saw that, well, you seem to be, you seem to be having unhealthy behavior no matter what I do. So if you're having unhealthy behavior no matter what I do, it can't be my behavior. So it can't be me. It's got to be something else. And mm -hmm. the common factor here is not a situation because you're having this unhealthy behavior 
regardless of situation. And you're having this behavior regardless of how compliant I am. And, and of course, I'm talking about my dad. Mm -hmm. So I finally came to the conclusion as a teenager, uh, probably at age 14, that it can't be me. Uh, I'm not a perfect kid. Uh, I, I did lots of things I shouldn't do. I got in lots of trouble, but still that didn't explain it. And so at the point that I started looking at the other data, I saw that even though uh, my dad, who could not explain, because, you know, my dad was a carpenter. He didn't study this stuff. Yeah. I, I was just, you know, and I don't mean to make this sound my dad, make my dad sound bad because I love my dad very much, miss him every day. But he also attributed his perception to me. So in a way, he was viewing me as a manipulator. It's your fault that I yell at you. It's mm. your fault that I get violent at you. So a person that mindset, the actual abuser, will actually view the victim as the manipulator. So I ask people, does that help? Are they correct? Are you the victim manipulating their behavior? Because, see, your argument ceases to hold water if that only works one way. That it's your abuser that's the manipulator. So the problem gets to be we just run around accusing each other of being manipulators. Yeah. And so um, long story short, or maybe long story longer, I, I set a boundary with my dad. I, I just basically said, I'm going to bless you with my absence. And, and, and if, if you're going to be in my life, uh, here's what that takes. Because I am not responsible for your yelling at me. I'm not responsible for your violence. Yeah. And uh, was he manipulating me or trying to get his way? You asked what I called it. I call it a, uh, a normal human being who, like all of us, want our way. I've never met one person ever that didn't want their way. Yeah. But they try to get it in a way that is unhealthy, which helps me focus in on the behavior and their thoughts that create it. They're literally catastrophizing, not getting their behavior. And tr I'm sorry, uh, they're literally catastrophizing, not getting their way and trying to get their way in unhealthy ways, which that's not manipulation at all. That's just a person doing the same thing I'm doing, trying to get my way. You know, I want my uh, shredded wheat and blueberries every morning, but I don't yell at people if I don't have them. Yeah. You know, I try to get many things. Uh, I try to get my back scratched. But if my wife don't doesn't scratch the right spot, I don't yell at her because she missed the spot, you know. No. So I'm not catastrophizing not getting my way. And the person that does actually, uh, and I don't mean this to be critical of people, but the people that do that, it's not that they're manipulators. They just have a very weak mindset. They literally believe that absence of getting their way is such a threat to them that they have to up the ante and do anything they can. But that still doesn't remove my ability to set a speed limit on that behavior and say, you know, I love you, but this doesn't work with me. Just because you try to sell me a car, I don't have to buy it. Are you going to pull out all the stops and try to sell it to me? Well, sure. Why, why, why wouldn't you? What kind of car salesman says, you know, hey, Heath, I've got this car. Man, if it's me, I probably wouldn't buy it. But, you know, it costs X amount of money. But you might want to go buy it from somebody else. Well, that's a horrible car salesman. They're going to do everything they can to save the car. But still, you have the decision-making capacity. So one more thing uh, before I yield the mic. Yeah. is that if you believe in manipulation, then what about this? How did I learn it? Well, what if we track back and we say, well, it was dad. Dad taught me how to be a manipulator. He manipulated me into being a manipulator, which means I'm not responsible for my manipulation. The manipulator that trained me to be a manipulator is responsible for it. But then if dad said, Grandma Meeks trained me to be a manipulator. So really, I as a manipulator, it's not my fault. It's the fault of the manipulator who is trained by the, but it's not their fault. It's the manipulator of the manipulator of the manipulator. 
So all of yeah. a sudden, if you're a person of faith, you know, which I am, it tracks back to God and God becomes the grand manipulator. And it's really God's fault. It's a problem of infinite regress. The, uh, uh, the other problem is, uh, what if uh, I come into your house and steal that nice SM, that SM7B mic? Yep. Yeah. About 400 bucks in it. I steal it, you know? And, um, and then I go to court and I say, well, actually, I didn't steal it. I just talked to you into giving it to me. And, and so who's responsible for that? So if I can be manipulated into doing evil, then even though I did the evil, it's not my fault because I was manipulated into doing it, which is about like saying, if I hit you in the head with a hammer, it's, 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 it's the hammer that we send to prison, not me, yeah. you know? So it gets to a problem of infinite regress of who's responsible for what, in which case we would just empty out all the prisons because it's not the prisoner's fault, it's the parents' fault. And it's not the parents' fault, it's the grandparents' fault, the great-grandparents' fault. So I'm much more of a, you know, Theodore Roosevelt, you know, the buck stops here. If yeah. I made a decision, I may have made it on incomplete data. I may have made it too rapidly. But at the end of the day, I did make it. And in the world of forensic psychology, that's what, you know, people like me are often asked to do. And, and the, only, the only out is the insanity defense. Yeah. So the question would be, is the ability to be manipulated a bit of insanity where it gets you off the hook if you can prove somebody manipulated you? And that is a very rare thing. Most people aren't successful at arguing that in an actual court of law, that they were manipulated into robbing a bank or killing a person or something like that, you know? Yeah, and and to your credit, uh, legally, the notion of I was just following orders was rejected by the Western world after Nazi Germany. So that sure. goes to your credit. And I, again, I agree completely. You don't, you should take accountability for everything in your life. Like you should, even, even when I think somebody is deceived, they're playing a role in it somehow. They're well, but, but again, but see, uh, but, but see, here's the difference. Deceived is the external locus of control, mm -hmm. which is the opposite of internal locus of control. So if I was deceived, it's not, excuse me, if I was deceived, it wasn't my fault. Except for Nuremberg, as you point out, uh, the Nuremberg trials, they rejected all of that. Yeah. Because that's what the soldiers would say. That's what these uh, operators of the, of the uh, concentration camps would say. You know, they're deceived by Hitler. They're deceived by the commanding officer. Uh, see, to, to assume, see, to me, deceived in itself means I had no free will to do otherwise. Because not only did you present me with flawed data, I lacked the inability to to accurately think about it i lack the ability to look into other data i lack the ability to act otherwise and so the hurdle i think you confront with manipulation is that question why did you lack the ability to do otherwise yeah and what neurological process explains that and i ask people that a lot you know i uh one thing is um uh, falsification, you know, I, I can falsify my theory that manipulation doesn't exist, you know, but uh, what about manipulation itself? You know, H how would you falsify that? And if you can't, and people I talk to that believe in this, they lack the ability to falsify it. Well, if you can't falsify it, then how is your theory of manipulation different than a fairy tale? You mm -hmm. know, the boogeyman made me do it. No. Yeah. Well, you got a photo of him, a video, you know, a, a fingerprint that he left on the bedpost. Well, ultimately, the belief in what I call the myth of manipulation becomes no better than a fairy tale, which is leveraged because it we think that we're safer saying that someone else made us do it. Yeah. 
and it's really no more than a fight or flight response, which is meaningful to me because of trauma. It becomes part of that because trauma is all about the fight or flight response. But the people that recover best from it are the people that at some point realize the power they had. They realize one of my favorite shows of all times talks about this. People just don't realize it. If you watch the show, A Few Good Men, it's all about manipulation hmm. and the absence of it. It's a show that starts out uh, really believing that manipulation is possible. But what happens at the end of the show when the two officers on trial, one finally says, well, one said, but what would what did we do wrong? What did we do wrong? We were just following orders. What did we do wrong? And the other officer says, because it was our job to protect our friend, and we didn't. Hmm. Yes, we got an order. Yes, we followed the order. But that did not remove that it was our responsibility to protect our friend, and we didn't, and he died. And, and that's a very dangerous thing to do. You know why? Well, because when we accept responsibility, when we finally give up the myth that we cannot be manipulated, we are inevitably confronted with ourselves. Mm. We are inevitably confronted with coming to terms with, I could have decided differently and I did not. Well, that's a very dangerous thing to do. Believe me, it, it, it's dangerous for me too. I've yeah. got a situation right now that uh, I did not, uh, I, I made too quick of a decision because I was in a hurry and uh, I lost a little bit of money. Man, that stings, you know, and I, I could blame the other person, say, hey, they're a scammer and they took me for a ride. Mm -mm. I clicked the button to pay that person. Click. They did not control this index finger. Yeah. I looked at the data. I didn't take enough time. I was in a hurry. I clicked the button and it cost me some money. But what a wonderful, wonderful learning experience that was. Yeah. You know, the pain of it is so very educational. And that's the thing that you can't benefit from if you believe in manipulation. You, you, la you lose the opportunity to learn to do differently next time. And so what happens next time? Well, the same thing. The same thing. Since you never took responsibility for your power that you had in that moment, it will happen again and again and again because you miss out on the educational pain of realizing I could have chosen differently. And mm -hmm. therefore, you keep blaming some boogeyman manipulator. And if it's their fault, you don't got to take responsibility because it's less painful to blame somebody else. There's a famous book. It's on the shelf right back there. Uh, the title of it is Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me. That is the man. Yeah, me too. You got that book. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. that that is the the cult of manipulation. That is their their slogan. And it is a cult. It is a cult. And you'll find people all over X promoting it. It is a cult. It works just like a cult. People come in and they brainwash themselves into believing uh, this person that I was with, they manipulated me into doing this, that, or the other. So they lose the lesson. And then they repeat the relationship and then they label every new relationship. Goodness, how do you find that many people that do that in your life? You know, they kind of yeah. think that they're just a manipulator magnet, except for there's no boogeyman. There's no manipulator. There's just me. And I keep making the same decision on poor and insufficient data over and over and over and over again. And some of these people come to believe that there's a manipulator around every corner. My yeah. neighbor's a manipulator. The pastor of the church is a manipulator. The guy at the gas station, the checkout clerk, everybody's a manipulator, you know, and it's just an unhealthy way to live, you know. But I will mm -hmm. say I make a lot of money at it because people come to me after they've ruined their lives with it and they say, gosh, Heath, I got to, you know, I got to stop, you know, I got to yeah. change this. And then they take their power back. So I hate to hog the mic. Go ahead. No, you're good. <laughs> the, the thing that's hard for me, is, and I mean, my podcast and 
the way I operate is all about nuance. I'm like 98% with you. I'm just not <laughs> quite to the point of saying manipulation is completely a myth. But I yeah. agree that like people use manipulation, gaslighting, they use those terms way too frequently. And it's always to blame some external source. I actually have a similar situation where uh, I was I was scammed, but it was my fault. I put money on a fake exchange and I ignored all the red flags that I, I my my technological literacy, my financial literacy, it was all there and I ignored it. And I, what I put as the blame is my own greed. My own greed is the reason I fell for the scam. So I believe that manipulation can happen and maybe I would consider that they tried to manipulate me, but I still put it on myself for well, what they, I they did. Try, yeah, so there's, there's a, a replacement terms has to happen. What they tried to do is they tried to get their way. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if, if you if you think that you're right, and they probably did, if they think they're right, if they think they deserve it, uh, you know, I do I do friends psychological exams, and I have a question. I won't say what it is because it's in my toolkit. I don't want to spoil the trick. But uh, ask people a question. It's kind of about stealing and theft and everything, and what you do with other people's property. And it amazes me the people that say their justification is well. They should take better care of their stuff. Yeah. If they don't want me to steal their stuff, they should take better care of their stuff. Yeah. I wouldn't let you steal my stuff because I like my stuff, you know? And and so that's just the way they look at it. You know, they have – and so what are they doing? They're just trying to get their way. Now, are they doing it dishonestly? Absolutely. Yeah. But it's up to me whether I fall for that or not. I, I have a self-talk thing I do, and it, it'll save me from future pain. Uh, but my painful experiences have taught me this lesson. I tell people, not just so they can hear, but so I can hear myself say it. When people are trying to sell me, I'll say, you know, I'm a terrible customer. I'll just have to tell you, I don't make decisions quick. I'll probably need a week, maybe a month to think about this. So you probably just want to try to sell somebody else because I'm not going to make a decision the first meeting. I'm probably not going to make a decision the first week or the first month. And by that time, you may be bored and you could have made so much money elsewhere. So present what, present what you've got. Yeah. And then I'll think about it for a month or two. <laughs> and by that point, they've kind of given up, you know. But so it's, it's, we can do one or two things. We can think fast or we can think slow. Yeah. If you think fast, you will think very shallow. You know, where if you think slow, you can think much more deeply. They both have their place. Thinking fast is great in house fires, car wrecks, you know, things like that. Uh, you know, if your car's on fire, you, you shouldn't have to sit there and ponder whether you should get out of the vehicle or not. Yeah. But things like making purchases when there's a salesman thinking fast is a mistake. And salesmen know this. Salesmen know. Well, they may not know, but but they know the technique. Um, they just can't put words to it. But but salesmen have some level of consciousness that if I can if I can uh, convince you there's scarcity, like I on X the other day, there's a huge creator, and I mean this is a really huge creator. Yeah. Said, hey Heath, you know we want you to be a member of this community. Uh, luckily for you, we have one golden ticket left. Well, what's that? That's just the argument from scarcity. Yeah. Uh, my first thought is, well, what are the chances? You know, I mean, really, what are the chances? It just so happens that you contact me and gosh, you know, this is the last golden ticket you have. It's not lost them. They called it a golden ticket, not a bronze ticket no. or a lead ticket or a wooden ticket. You know, I mean, a wooden ticket, that'd be kind of cool. You could send me that in the mail, but it's a golden ticket, a golden ticket. And I say, well, you know. Uh, I, I'd hate to really rob somebody else of that opportunity. So you should probably offer that to somebody else. <laughs> and uh, they did. And then uh, through another account that they didn't know was me because I have some niche accounts, they contacted me and offered me the last golden ticket. That is amazing. <laughs> after they'd already gotten rid of the last golden ticket. 
<laughs> you're lucky. I mean, you're extremely lucky. <laughs> I mean, it's a sales thing, right? You got to build it that is. urgency, right? Yeah, or create urgency, you know. And and but but see, we we have the ability, and and it's all about assessing value. You know, where do you assess more value? Do you assess more value at giving yourself time to think, or do you assess more value over making a reflexive, you know? decision that may get you into trouble. Well, I'd rather avoid this and just, I mean, what's going to happen if I miss out? Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. I was okay before I was offered the golden ticket. I'm okay after somebody else got the golden ticket. I'll do just fine and die a happy person never getting that golden ticket. And so this is where people think that they're going to miss out on something, but what, you're going to miss out on what? You know? Yeah. But who, who's in charge of that? The person selling the golden ticket or you thinking that you're in some danger, and that's what it really is. It's a belief that I'm in danger of something if I don't make this purchase. No. Well, finish the sentence. In danger of what? You know, uh, you know, if, if you're a guy, you know, you and I are guys, you know, the PG-13 rating coming up, okay? PG-13. Uh, if you're a guy, what's going to happen? Your little boy parts going to fall off. Gosh, Heath, what happened to you? You know, I go to my prosthetic exam. My urologist says, gosh, Heath, what happened to you? You know, you're missing some body parts. Well, I didn't buy that golden ticket and they just fell off. <laughs> well, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. So what I'm talking about is de-catastrophize. De-catastrophize. Uh, let's just take an abuse situation really, really quick. Uh, people will often find more value in compliance and avoiding confrontation. And then they blame that on manipulation. But really what's going on is you believe that unless you comply, you're unsafe. Now you may be, I, I deal with lots and lots of abuse situations, but there's an answer for that too. And that's called a safety plan and a go bag and uh, people that can help you. And a phone number that in the States uh, is spelled 911. And having an extra cell phone and having an extra set of car keys and letting a trusted neighbor know what's going on and having a plan. But uh, 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 being in the household of someone who is abusive does not mean you lack free will. It does not mean you lack agency. And the terrible thing is that people convince themselves of that and they simply freeze and they're in that situation for months and months and months or years and years and years. Yeah. And sometimes it ends extremely poorly. Um, well, yeah, yeah. Because it's not going to get better taking no action. Yeah. It's, it's not going to get better thinking I can do no other because I'm being manipulated to stay. Again, it's a hard choice, you know, but that hard choice is very, very dangerous because then uh, you're left with, I made the decision to leave. Yeah. So I, I have one other example, and sure. I didn't mean to take up the whole podcast with this, but it's been a great conversation, <laughs> so I don't mind. Uh, okay, in the book, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me, there is a part that I'm at that I just got over, and it's uh, going into the the craze in the 90s of teachers being accused of sexual abuse of children. And then there were some court cases and children were essentially coached into claiming abuse. And I would see that as manipulation. So what would you call that? What would you, how would you categorize that? Um, of, of course, I have a bias against the word manipulation. That is a poor yeah. interview technique. Uh, it happens the same in hypnosis when people will try to do, um, you know, hypnosis about tragic events. Um, uh, they, they will say things like, uh, if you ask the brain a question, the brain's going to come up with an answer, whether there's really an answer or not. And in that way, AI is a bit like the brain, is that uh, it, it'll just kind of spit out data and a fairy tale. And, you know, it's called a hallucination, but it's not really a hallucination. It's, it's, it's a, uh, it, it's just doing what you ask it to do. It's, it's, AI doesn't care if it gives you an accurate answer. Uh, it is programmed to give an answer. Mm -hmm. And 
under hypnosis, uh, the brain becomes a bit like AI, but you can't you can't get out of it what's not already there. So let me slow down and see if I can explain this where it's understandable to everybody. If I ask you, would you like an ice cream cone? Uh, you might say yes or no, but you already know what an ice cream cone is. Therefore, you can give me a response whether it's yes or no. That answer may be, well, hey, now that you mention it, I wasn't thinking about it, but you're right. I would like an ice cream cone. Now, did I plant that information? No, I just asked you about it. I just opened a door where those words were able to come out of your mouth, but they pre-existed mm. in your brain before you spat them out of your mouth. Now, does that mean they're accurate? Does that mean that you think an ice cream cone is good for you? Do you think that an ice cream cone is the best thing you should have for dinner? Does that mean that you should have a whole diet of ice cream cones? No, but the brain manufactures thoughts. That's just what the brain does. The brain manufactures thoughts the way blizzards manufacture snowflakes. It's just what the brain does. And so we have many, many, many thousands of thoughts every day. So let's go to a kid who doesn't know what's happening and they can't understand what's happening. And they're presented something like this may have been what happened. And then since they're presented with it, since they were already thinking of it anyway as a possibility, even beneath their level of conscious awareness, in an interview with an authority figure, that is what comes out of their mouth. Does that mean they believe it? No, but that is what gets written down. Any more than, uh, I, you know, people in an argument will say things that were in their mind, but that's not what they mean. I hate you. I wish you were dead. I wish we weren't married. We should have never gotten married. I wish you'd you know, never been born. So people say things not because they mean them, but because they have the ability to think them. Hmm. If they're not already there, you'll never hear them. For instance, if I ask you, have you ever awoken in the middle of the night terrified of a flibber fidget? Has that ever happened to you? Not that I can remember, no. Because that information's not there. Yeah. Now, if yeah. I start adding data to it, you might decide what to think about that, and you might decide, well, Heath, that's just silly, or you might decide, holy crap, that sounds so scary. Man, I better, I better make accommodations, make sure a flibber fidget doesn't come in the middle of the night and wake me up and eat my face off. Uh, but before I said that, since that data wasn't there, you were unable to think about it. But now that you are able to think about it, it's up to you what value to add to it. But just because you may spit that out in the middle of an argument, you're just a freaking flipper fidget. Does that mean that that's what you think about me? No, that's just the top of mind thought in that moment. Top of mind thoughts are many times inaccurate. It's kind of like saying, you know, where do you want to eat lunch? And you think, I want to eat lunch at the pizza place. Yeah. And then we had the pizza place. And then you get to think, ah, gosh, why did I say that? I don't really want a pizza. Gosh, why did I say pizza? You know, I'd rather have salad, you know, because I'm dieting or something. So just because a kid spits out a top of mind thought doesn't mean they've been manipulated. It doesn't mean that that's an accurate thought. It just means that that was the result of a poor interview technique. Because interviewers back in the 90s would, well... The, what's the term for it? I can't remember the term. They would muddy the water because they would give too much information. You know, yeah. um, they would Where say they, they touch you on the doll, and then it's like, oh, oh yeah. Okay. Well, they would say, you know, where were you touched? Yeah. Well, you've already yeah. muddied the water. Yeah, you like know? a leading question. Yeah, it's a leading question. And yeah. and is that planting something? No, it's already there. You know, they know their body parts. They're just going to give you an answer. You know, they. They and, and they're going to go for the most catastrophic, you know, sensitive spot. And they're not going to say, well, he touched me on the elbow. How often do you think about your elbow? Yeah. You never. know, I rub my elbow all day long. No, but you 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 go to the bathroom all day long. You know, and yeah. so, yeah, it's it's a false positive. It's a false positive. And, and hypnotherapists do the same thing. They'll say, remember back when you were at granddad's house? Well, I would never do that. 
you know, that's, that's kind of mudding the water, you know, yeah. and, um, is the thought of granddad already there? Yeah, but they were consciously, they were not consciously aware of it and you brought it up. And so it becomes a top of mind thought that escapes. And with yeah. a kid whose brain is still developing, and this is an argument against my argument of manipulation, but it's only because level of cognitive development. Mm. I thank you for the answer. That was a really thoughtful answer and uh, really well put. I want to move on to labels because I feel like it ties in. And you had a really good post on labels, uh, something I agreed with completely. Because a manipulator would be a label. And uh, I'm looking at labels more of like dehumanization. That's what your post is about. And I think that's such an important topic because in our divided world, especially in the U.S., you see it every day where somebody is, you know, uh, uh, conservatives or Republicans or Trump supporters are going to be uh, insurrectionists and then uh, Biden supporters are libtards or whatever it might be, you know, like there's all these dehumanizing words that people use so that and I, the way i look at it is if i can give you a label which i try not to use labels for people if i can give you a label that puts you in a category where you're not relevant i don't have to listen to you or i don't have to respect your humanity absolutely I'd love, okay i'd love to hear you expand on it a bit well, no, I, I think it, I think it is a very sabotaging shortcut, and you know, it it the 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 the, the logical fallacy uh, is an ad hominem. If I can say, well, you know, I know you just told me this equation for pi, but since you're an idiot, it must not be correct. You know, I can just put you in the box and and and, and immediately dismiss you because of course, of course, you're an idiot. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, you're intellectually impaired, so, you know, what do you know? Or you're a Democrat, what do you know? Or you're a Republican, what do you know? And, you know, I, my, my favorite example of this is uh, Richard Feynman, famous Caltech physicist, Nobel Prize winner, who was often asked to give, uh, he, was, uh, he was asked, you know, what do you call that? And he said, I don't know, I can just explain the mechanics. I don't know what it's called, I can explain the process. So really, labels cause more ignorance because they narrow our field of vision such that we ignore everything else. And, and that's a mistake, you know, that's, that's a mistake. I, I remember the congressional hearings where Feynman was asked to figure out why the space shuttle exploded and after millions of dollars spent, Another scientist trying to explain it. He showed up at the hearing with a uh, a glass of ice water and an O-ring, you know, a little black O-ring, and he dropped it into the glass water. And you know, uh, mm -hmm. the O-rings on the space shuttle weren't meant to function at that low of a temp, and so they got brilliant. They snapped, and boom, people died. Uh, what do you call that? I don't know, but that yeah. was the process. And so, if we can ignore labels and look at, let's just talk manipulation, instead of call it manipulation, ask, you know, what, what function does this person's behavior serve? What function does this person's behavior serve? Well, if you're in a relationship where the other person automatically looks at you as a threat or a potential threat, Based on their history, tragic though it may have been, that is not lost on you. Mm -hmm. And if you look at a, a particular a man in a relationship, a man run off of confirmation and significance, and the person they have just you know gotten in a relationship with looks at them as a threat, then that becomes a threat to their confirmation and significance. And so all of a sudden you have two people looking at each other as an active threat. 
And when you look at each other as an active threat, you're telling your brain to either run away, to fight, or to freeze. Hmm. Well, that's a recipe for disaster in any relationship. And then you go into the next relationship, and your mind is already set that this person could be a manipulator. So once you develop a target in your brain, your brain hones in on that, doubles down on it, and you and and you you're subject to confirmation bias, and you start picking data to prove your label for this person. See, I told you, yeah. they're asking me to get them a cup of milk because they're a manipulator. This is just more evidence of manipulation. Uh, they didn't take the trash out because they're trying to manipulate me into doing it. Uh, they asked me for spaghetti because they're trying to manipulate me into making them spaghetti when I really want salad or something, you know. Yeah. So, so the brain really doubles down on it, and it's 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 labels, you know. It's it's labels were have been used effectively across human history for some of the greatest travesties that humans have ever committed. Because yeah. once you label somebody, they become, in your mind, less than human. Yeah. And it's easier, once you've labeled something as less than human, it becomes a thing and easier to see it as a thing. I ask people about people you label manipulators. Well, let's just say that you label them as a manipulator at 38 or 36 or 26. What should we do with them? Does that mean they can never, ever be in another relationship? We should just, what? off with their heads or something. Let's execute all the manipulators. You know, what should we do with these people? Is there no redemption? Can they not change? Well, according to some people, yeah, yeah, they, they can never change, you know. Uh, but then again, that's what the Nazis said about the Jewish people. Yeah. They were to label them. That's what American forces said about the Germans, and they called them Krauts. And that's what American soldiers said about the Japanese and called them Japs. They were no longer humans, but, you know, Japs or whatever other name. Uh, the problem is our society being very incongruent will have labels that are okay. No. And uh, I'll remind people the lesson of history was that in the U.S., in my state of Arkansas, it was okay to label human beings such that we could put them in internment camps and everybody was okay with that. No. And you see the same thing on social media, that people will be labeled, people who would never label somebody because of race or religion or anything else. They will label people as gaslighters, manipulators, you know, and they will put them in a electronic internment camp. And I ask, how's that different? How's that different than labeling anybody? So how about we see others as human beings? Now, I'm not saying that you have to hold hands with these people and take long walks in the park, but why do we got to label them? Why can't we just say, well, you know, uh, this person is trying to get their way. Uh, they're doing so in an unhealthy way. And so I'm going to set some boundaries with them. And by the way, it's not up to somebody else to honor your boundaries. And that's a mistake that people often make. Oh, you violated yeah. my boundary. Well, of course, it's not their boundary. No. If I set a boundary, it's up to me to enforce it, not you. It's up to me to enforce it. And I do that every day. I'll have conversations with people on the phone who are yelling at me, cussing at me because, you know, it's adversarial, friends at psychology. I get referrals from the court. I get referrals from workplaces and things like that. And I'll say, you know, I want to continue the conversation. But here are the conditions under which we can continue it. And if not, then I'll have to hang up. Now, they may be yelling so loud that they don't perceive a lot of that, but that's not up to me. I say what I say, and then I say, thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and end the call now. We can talk later. Click. Yeah. And so it's not that I'm dealing with a manipulator. I'm dealing with somebody that needs me to be a healthy human being. And you cannot be a healthy human being with that type of behavior if you think you have to run away from it. Now, if they have a weapon, that's another thing. If yeah. they're threatening violence, you know, fist or whatever, uh, assault or, or battery, 
that's another thing. There's another there's another solution to that in the states that's called nine one one. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that, the concept of labels is pretty interesting because I, I bet if if we backed up our entire conversation and we just focused on the definitions and just really, really worked them out until we agreed, okay, this is what manipulation means. This is what free will means. If we just focused completely on that, we probably wouldn't have disagreement. Well, our disagreements would be up until the time that we agreed on the definition. Yeah. And then we would probably see completely eye to eye. So the labels are I would agree, a big problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, with, with uh, uh, there, there's research behind that. You know, the uh, the Pygmalion effect is that uh, once I tell you um, here is the label for this person, you know, you, you will decide whether to add value to that or not. And if you don't have a reason not to add value to it, you know, you may underthink it, as I say. But the research is, and I'll just briefly go through it really quick in the time we have, uh, you know, uh, we got about to the top there, we got about 14 minutes left, so I'll try to hurry, is that a researcher gathered together a group of participants. Listeners, listen carefully. A researcher gathered together a group of participants. He administered an academic test. And then he told the teachers, that this group of students scored really, really low. So they're impaired intellectually, behaviorally. You'll probably have a lot of trouble. They probably won't do very well. And this group of students, they did extraordinarily. They are gifted and talented. And then, lo and behold, that's exactly what the teachers found. The teachers found that, true to form, this is what described the students. But who were the research participants? Who was the experiment designed to study? Not the students. It was designed to study the teachers. Since the teachers were told this is the label of these students, that's what the teachers saw. That researcher, Rosenthal, went home to his office with those big assessments and never looked at them. He threw them in the trash, and then he randomly selected students who all in a previous test, I believe if I got my my story straight, uh, scored equally. They scored equally. Uh, But once you decide in your mind, this person's a manipulator, that's all you'll be able to see. Yeah. So who's doing the manipulating? Actually, the person who is labeling a person as a manipulator is the manipulator of their own thought processes and they sabotage themselves and their relationships greatly by labeling it as that. Yeah. I imagine there's some, well, a likely potential for a student, for instance, if you label a student, a stupid student or a dumb person yeah, or a child, your child, if they hear you say that they will start adopting that label that you've put on them too. They will. So yeah. I, I think it's really valuable to make sure you uh, pay attention to what you're calling people, especially people you love, you know? Well, the, uh, a quick thing, too, on the gaslighting thing, uh, uh, a discussion I love to have with people that believe in the gaslighting label, and, and maybe you and I can go through this. Would you agree that someone who, if it's possible, gaslights somebody is kind of not right? It's kind of a crazy thing to do, right? Trying to go around, convince people that they're crazy. Isn't that kind of a crazy thing to do? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah it's a crazy thing. To, why, why would you try to do that? That's really off, you know. So um, let's take it a step further. So essentially what's going on when you call somebody a gaslighter, since you agree that being a gaslighter is crazy, you're really telling a person that they're crazy. Well, I guess which I really means, th- yeah, which really means that the person accusing another person of gaslighting is one gaslighting. Because I'm trying to convince you that you're crazy enough to gaslight, which really by that definition means that I'm the gaslighter. Because I'm trying to convince you you're crazy enough to gaslight. Yeah, I guess <laughs> I, I wouldn't call gaslighting, if it exists, I wouldn't call it crazy. It's okay. actually very, it's, it's self-preservation. If I can convince you you're wrong, I preserve my position or I preserve my 
embarrassment from coming out or whatever it might be. So it's actually self-preservation to convince somebody that even though you know that they're correct, that they're crazy and they're misremembering or whatever it might be. Well, which brings us to another point is that uh, we, we started out the conversation talking that uh, the brain is incapable of storing every experience as a memory. Yeah. Which means if we're together in a space, I may store some things as a memory that you don't. And you may store some things as a memory that I don't. So essentially what I find in my work with people is they're arguing over what got stored as a memory and what didn't. Hmm. And then they're arguing over perception, thinking that since you're telling me my perception is not accurate, you're telling me that I'm crazy, which is you gaslighting me. Hmm. And they may say that. They may say that you're crazy. But uh, that doesn't mean that they're trying to make you think you're crazy because we're back to manipulation. I don't think that I, I would challenge people, bring me the best, quote, gas lighter in the world. Put them in front of me. Turn them on. See if they can do it to me. If they can't do it to me, then who can they do it to? Your neighbor, your coworkers. Who can they do it to? How do we establish uh, to a statistical level of reliability that this skill exists? And if we can't uh, produce a statistically reliable sample, then I would argue it doesn't exist at all. It's a fairy tale. So you really have to be willing to do some statistics on it. And when we do that, it is unproven because, you know, I kind of put this tongue in cheek. If if gaslighting exists, which is kind of a type of, if you agree with manipulation, kind of manipulation, controlling, you know, then why doesn't our government do that with four nations and get them to do our will? You know, why doesn't Russia do it with Ukraine? Why don't we train teachers to do it with students so that they have no discipline problems? because they have manipulated their students into being perfect students and to developing great study skills and to being straight A students. Why don't we take this power of manipulation into the prisons and manipulate prisoners and gaslight prisoners into being perfect citizens in society and we can close down all the prisons? There's one answer that's because it does not exist. Awesome. Uh, I loved hearing your perspective. It's, it's awesome. I would love to do this again. Um, I love to ask people that come on the podcast about books because I'm a big reader and I think books are amazing. You've mentioned uh, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me, which I highly recommend too. Any other books that you recommend? Uh, yeah, yeah. And it's one of my examples against gaslighting manipulation where there's a young man in uh, Germany who finished uh, med school and had become a psychiatrist. Uh, he had gotten married. Uh, as the story goes, uh, I think, uh, you know, my understanding is his wife uh, became pregnant. And so they were expecting. And then the Nazis came. And the Nazis imprisoned him and his wife and his mother and his father. And I think it was his sister. And all of his neighbors and all of his friends and all of his classmates, and they all went to concentration camps. And they worked them to within an inch of their lives, often half clothed, often without shoes, often unfed at the point of rifles. And the ones that survived, the ones that didn't survive were gassed. And Victor, Vic, would walk by the bodies of his dead neighbors. And the Nazis killed his mother and killed his father and killed his pregnant wife. Mm. And this man still, still, after all of these tragic conditions in this very statement, having undergone all of this in his statement, disagreed with the power of someone to gaslight and the power of someone to manipulate when he said, and I hope I get the quote right, everything can be taken from a person. But the last and greatest of all things, the power to choose your own thoughts, the power to choose your own way. That is an mm -hmm. indictment against manipulation and gaslighting. And I challenge anybody, no matter the tragedy of the situation, does your situation compare with Victor's? 
Have your neighbors been murdered in front of you? Have you walked across their bodies? Have your family members been murdered? And have you been starved and put naked to work in the freezing cold? And if Victor can withstand that and not be manipulated or gaslit, then why not the rest of us? So this I like to remind me, that book is, say it again. Man Search for Meaning. Man Search for Meaning. And okay. so that is an indictment against any kind of belief in the myth of manipulation and the myth of gaslighting is that if it exists, Victor would not have been successful because uh, no one endured more that I know of uh, than him. And he still maintained no one robs me of uh, my thought about my own self. No, I'm not crazy. Uh, no, you can't manipulate me. Uh, you can do things to my body. You can chain me and you can punish me physically. But I always have the choice of how to think. Martyrs are another example that they were told you will die. Uh, the Romans would tell the Christians you will die unless you do this. And they still died. Uh, they still chose death over even saying out loud. Uh, so, you know, how can how can manipulation exist or gaslighting exist if we have so many examples? This the Jewish people as a nation have withstood this for millennia. You know, uh, you'll always hear manipulation as a external locus of control attempt, an attempt to believe that external forces. Uh, control internal thought processes, but Victor Frankl in his book, Man Search for Meaning, would greatly disagree with that. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. It is a great book. Um, I also highly recommend that one. Um, <laughs> Dr. Heath, before we wrap up, do you want to give listeners a way to find you on X? Uh, you have a podcast. Tell them, tell them anything you want to share. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's uh, uh, therapy underscore bites at therapy underscore bites. We're taking a bite out of common psychological myths and misperceptions. And uh, I do a midday mindset, which is 55 minutes on a psychological topic to kind of help people reset their mindset midday, 12 p.m. Central Standard Time, Monday through Friday. And the podcast is on wherever you get podcasts. And it is also called Therapy Bites. I think we have 84 episodes out now and uh, uh, working to get into a uh, a flow state of, of getting back to producing one a week, but uh, only so many hours in a day. But I want to thank you for being on here. Yeah. For having me. It's great fun. I love your backdrop, man. I love that. Thank the you. tree. and That's perfect. That's yeah, amazing. I yeah. I didn't have the black light on the, for the so first time. thank like, you. Uh, 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 any, any parting questions for me? Uh, that's it. I think uh, if you'd ever want to come back on, I'd love to have a longer conversation with you. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Well, let's do it. Again. Yeah. It, it, then where all did you stream this today? I didn't stream it. So I record and uh, I'll edit it down later. Uh, oh. I'll send it to my editor and then we'll put it on the podcast later. Oh, okay. So I thought we were live all this time. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's okay. I, I do, I do, I do a... Uh, too, but. Yeah, yeah, I know you can live stream. I, I have, uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get back in the habit of doing a live stream thing called Executive Espresso, and I should get you on that someday. That is a strict 18 minute live stream podcast. 18 minutes. Hmm, wow. Done, done, done. 18 minutes, and yeah. so it's it's a video live stream. I live stream hmm. to Facebook, uh, YouTube, LinkedIn, and X. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. I can live stream. I just I haven't done that yet. What so. do you use to edit? Uh, so my editor uses uh, Logic Pro. If I'm oh. editing myself, I use Ableton, but I'm a music producer too. So it, I mean, oh, it, wow. I already knew how to do that before I started the podcast. So. Oh, okay. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. Well, I, I appreciate the discussions online. I love talking about things like that. So I'll see you in the timeline. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Heath. Hey, thank you. Bye-bye now. Yeah. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a five-star review on Spotify and Apple. It goes a long way in helping the podcast grow and reach more listeners. You can also like and subscribe on YouTube. And if you want to support the show, you can go to FractalZoo.net, where I have unique Fractal-inspired clothing. Each purchase goes directly toward helping the podcast grow. 
I'll also leave my Amazon affiliate link in the description. You can click on that before making an Amazon purchase and a small commission may go to the podcast. I love to connect with my audience, so find me on Twitter or X at RDTM Podcast. That's A R T I E T M Podcast. Or you can find me on Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for listening today. That's it for this one. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.